So next up is Paul. Uh, he did his PhD right here in Toronto with Igor Yurcicen and Linda Penn. Um, in 2009, he started his own group at the OICR and is now using basically sequencing data to to find new biomarkers. And he's going to talk about stuff nobody else wants to talk about. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, and I'm happy that I got to replace somebody who also had the name Paul. That's uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a bunch of things that um, most people don't talk about. And a lot of them get around things that get overlooked in bioinformatics, things like our assumptions, things like what are the null distributions of some of the distributions that we look like, the effects of how we process or analyze our data, and just how reproducible the things that we are, the things that we do are. I'll start off very quickly by giving an overview of what my team does and kind of formulating the general problem that we try to tackle. So my lab mostly focuses on two areas. One is the comparison of algorithms. How do we find the right way to do any particular type of data analysis? And the second is, can we predict a clinically relevant phenotype from some sort of large data? Can I tell you which patients are going to have a recurrence after lung cancer, after they have their lungs removed? Can I tell you which old men are going to have prostate cancer and which ones probably have an insignificant disease that's not going to lead to mortality? Questions like that. And uh, mostly, we're cancer site agnostic. I'm really interested in the data set. So if there's a really fascinating data set with imaging and genomic characterization in head and neck cancer, I'm just as interested in that as I might be in, in other areas. Um, that being said, I'll talk about a number of things that are kind of miscellaneous and related to multiple tumor types, and then some prostate cancer stuff towards the end. So, Fundamentally, I, I think of myself as a biologist. I'm trying to tackle a very fundamental translational question in cancer research. And the problem here is that if you take a look at an individual patient, uh, patient's outcome, we cannot predict it at time zero. So we can't tell you at time zero, this is likely what's going to happen at time five years. For example, this is a survival curve. At time zero, 100% of patients are alive. And by six or seven years into the study, 50% of patients have died. The problem is, 50% of patients isn't everybody, and our default knowledge of them is half the patients are going to die and need better treatment than we give them now, but another half of them are going to still be alive. And those half we might even be over-treating currently, never mind considering giving more, more serious treatment to it. And so the obvious solution is to divide these patients into two groups. We want to identify those that are going to have a failure early and give them more treatment, and identify those that will not, and give them at least the same treatment, if not a, a de-intensification of that therapy. And so this is very much not a new idea. Um, the first studies in this go back uh, over a decade now, and they basically came up with the idea that in cancer there are a small number of distinct tumor subtypes, and that each of those would have an mRNA profile, or for that matter, any profile that was relatively tight and distinct, and that those would lead to distinctive outcomes. And so as bioinformaticians, we would immediately say that's pattern discovery. We're looking for subtypes of a disease. And the first and probably most famous study was one by um, uh, the Sorley group, or uh, at the time she was with uh, Charles Soterio. Um, and they looked at breast cancer and showed that breast cancer, using trivial clustering techniques, like the kind of hierarchical clustering that we always use, breaks into five subtypes, and you didn't have to work too hard to get that done. And that paper is just about 12 years old. And those subtypes had profoundly different patient survival. In their training cohort, they showed that there was 90% survival for this luminal A subtype, and zero peak patients still alive four years later for an aggressive basal subtype of breast cancer. And that transformed breast cancer research and a lot of cancer research because it, it made sense to what clinicians see. Not all tumors respond in the same way. Shockingly then, it took almost six years before somebody bothered to properly reproduce those subtypes. And unsurprisingly, when you use an independent cohort, the magnitude of survival differences is much diminished. It's still there, it's still very profound, and it's clinically relevant in treatment today. But we're now seeing differences in survival of 15 or 20% instead of 60 or 70%. Unfortunately, that's not true for other tumor subtypes. So for example, in lung cancer, David Beer's group at the University of Michigan attempted to do the exact same thing. They were doing it at basically the same time. They published a year later. 
and they identified subtypes of lung cancer, different clusters, that they thought had profoundly different survival. Unfortunately, that was not reproduced in any subsequent validation cohort. Similarly, a group in Duke did some very interesting Bayesian modeling of different techniques to try to understand uh, or try to predict survival in lung, colon, and other tumor types, and they had really impressive survival curves, such impressive survival curves that the data is fraudulent and has all been retracted now. <laughs> and so if you kind of look at this honestly, as a number of people have done, uh, you'll find that there's probably just too many subtypes of cancer for this to work. This is a picture of lung cancer. Genes are columns, patients are rows. And you can see that even just looking at these six genes, there are so many small subtypes. Patients that have low levels of HIF1 alpha, hypoxia marker, and high levels of this immunoprotein, suggesting immune cell infiltration, or patients that have low levels of this immunoprotein and intermediate levels of the other genes. And, and we think that there are probably hundreds of subtypes of most cancers, and breast cancer is just an exception to that. And that, of course, explains why power analyses suggested that we really couldn't find biomarkers using these techniques without having at least thousands of patients to find a reproducible biomarker. So the hypothesis changed and shifted, and we started to think that there are probably a large number of distinct tumor subtypes. But their overlapping, their mRNA profiles would overlap and be complementary in some way, and these would link to distinct outcomes. And so the idea was that we could do a better job with that by applying machine learning techniques. And so that's something that the entire field did, including myself, during my PhD. And after a few years of machine learning work, we started to realize that we were actually tapping out the predictive capacity of the data sets. So for example, the state-of-the-art biomarkers in lung cancer will get 99.9 .9 plus percent of the potential predictive information from a given data set. So you really can't use mRNA to do any better. That's good. The problem is that accuracy is about 66%. So if you're a patient and somebody says, we don't think your tumor is going to come back, we're 66% confident, so we're not going to give you chemotherapy. I personally would say, give me the chemotherapy, I don't care. And no clinician is going to be willing to make a, a decision based on a biomarker that is only accurate two thirds of the time. So as a result, we realized that we have to do a much better job in, in having accuracy, but individual data types or individual data sets are insufficient. And so the more recent hypothesis in the field is that we need a large number of tumor, of, uh, we have a large number of tumor subtypes. They have complex molecular profiles that have to be considered at multiple levels, DNA, RNA, protein, epigenomics, and we have to link those to the distinct clinical outcomes. And so that means we should be doing some sort of systems biology, machine learning approach, integrating all those data together. So what do you actually want in an algorithm? What are the things that we're trying to build? I would propose that they include, it be accurate, it should work. It should be extensible. If you take a look at every analysis that's done in the literature right now, it uses a different algorithm, a different tweak, a different way of doing it. That's not sensible for a large scale production uh, area in medicine. So instead, we want something that can handle any problem in any data set reasonably well. It should be clinically focused. It should link to treatment options, include what doctors already know about the disease. And for that matter, it might even need to incorporate cost characteristics in single-payer health systems like our own. And it should be fast. If you can't tell a patient this is how they should be treated for three months, then the prediction is useless. So we should be able to do the entire genomic characterization and bioinformatics in a day. So, that's kind of the goal of what I'm trying to take my lab to be able to do. Along the way, we face a lot of challenges. I'll point out for this audience some of the key things that cause us headache, and then we'll go over some of them in a bit of detail. One, we have far more data than we can store. So uh, I must get an email every week asking if we can delete a certain data set from our systems admin. And that's perfectly reasonable. And the answer is usually no, no, we really need that data. Oh, we really, really need that data. Um, but the fact is that we probably have five or six petabytes of storage at OICR, and it's full. I mean, we can flux in new studies and things like that, but it's simply insufficient. And it makes your life much more difficult as a researcher when you're always thinking about that. Uh, I would contend that we have no idea really how to analyze our data, and I'll go through that in a little bit of detail. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, we can't, I'm supposed to say find enough well-trained people, but you can tell what I was thinking about when I wrote that. Um, so we simply can't find enough good people, and if anybody wants a, a job in my lab, there's a lot of them available, and we, we just can't find in people who have the skill set in software engineering, biostatistical analysis, machine learning, experience with next-gen sequencing data. And maybe most pressingly, uh, anytime you do large-scale data analysis, you have to balance three things. You wonder, can I do this quickly because other people are answering the same biological question? Can we do it right because I'm a perfectionist and want to make sure I've got everything correct? And I don't want to do this over and over again in an ad hoc way. I want to make sure that the next time I do it, I don't have to put as much effort into it. And finding the right way to balance those three competing interests is very challenging. And lastly, every time we think we know how to analyze a type of data, it goes away. Genomics technologies improve or change so quickly that just as I felt pretty comfortable that we could analyze any Affymetrics data set you threw at us, nobody uses Affymetrics arrays anymore. And that means that we're always kind of behind trying to catch up to the data generation technology. So let's talk mostly about what I mean when I say I don't think we know how to analyze our data. These are things that I think as a community we usually don't want to talk about. So let's talk first about assumptions of our statistical models. I'll give one simple example. Uh, so all of the survival plots that I showed are uh, analyzed using, using something very standard called Cox Proportional Hazards Modeling. It's you know, one of the first things that you'll learn in any biostatistics course. It's fairly straightforward. And it has a couple of assumptions. One is proportional hazards, and the other one is non-informative censoring. Non-informative censoring just means that patients don't drop out of your study just because they're having a toxicity in response to a treatment. If that's happening, then you've got some sort of a bias there. You want people who leave the study and decide they don't want to participate to be a random group. But the proportional hazards really just says that there shouldn't be a change in which your effect modulates survival over time. So if a gene is a bad thing to have mutated in cancer, it should be bad at time zero, time one, time three, time five, time 10. And that should be basically proportional. It shouldn't change over time. Is that actually true about genomic data? Uh, I can tell you that you almost will never see this assumption tested in any clinical or biomedical journal. Uh, and we're taking a look at the Metabric cohort, which is 2,000 patients with mRNA and C or CMB measurements, uh, each with uh, at least, I think the median survival is 10 years, so large data set. And the p-value indicates the failure of the Cox proportional hazards assumption. And in this bottom bin, you can see that 5,000 out of about 20,000 genes at the CNB level and about 40% of those at the uh, RNA level fail the assumption. So Metabric was published in Nature. There are dozens of studies that have used it. Last year, at one point in time, I looked through all of the ones that had been published at that point in time. Not a single address the fact that the proportional hazards assumption isn't met. So as bioinformaticians, we're not really biostatisticians, and we will sometimes not do things like this. And that can have profound effects on our results. And so here's an example of the survival difference that we get um, using uh, a standard Cox proportional hazards model, not adjusting for the failure of the assumption. And we can see that the difference in outcome is 1.44, so about 44% increase in hazard. However, if we did the analysis properly, the actual true result is 99%. 44% is enough that, as a clinical trial, it wouldn't be considered an interesting result. 99% that we would have missed by not doing the result, the analysis correctly, is actually clinically relevant. And if you take a look at the cases where the Cox proportional hazards assumption fails, in the Metabrick cohort, you can see that in most cases, this is the corrected model and this is the actual. The um, incorrect statistical analysis underestimates the true association with outcome. So we have a challenging clinical question that we are actually penalizing ourselves by not using the correct statistical approaches for it. So I think that's a good example of something that we do all the time, but that we never talk about. I'll give another example something about random markers and null distributions. So a long time ago, during my PhD, we developed a nice technique for doing feature selection to identify good genes that would make a, a good biomarker. And it's a modified gradient descent approach, and it doesn't entirely matter how we did it, but 
Um, when we do it, we were able to get some nice validation in a pool of studies from, from different patients, borderline clinically relevant effects and something that we might be interested in. And I thought I was pretty proud of myself and was going to go graduate. And we, we got this question from a reviewer saying, well, how good is this relative to all possible biomarkers? And my supervisor said, I wonder if you can solve that. And I said, we can just write something. He says, think about it. You might come up with a way of, of looking at that. And so what we did is take a look at actually the uh, difference here, not as a, a hazard ratio, but as a predictive accuracy. And we converted it from a continuous problem into a binary one. And then we looked at that binary problem in a series of random signatures. So our biomarker was six genes, so we started pulling six random genes from the genome and asking did they make a good biomarker. And we did that 10 million times, so a reasonable number of times, and we used four different validation data sets to see our results. And the results were kind of encouraging. In one of our data sets, this is our training data set, the, uh, so this is a measure of statistical significance, this is the density plot. Um, in one of our data sets, our biomarker was in the top one in 100,000. And in our validation data sets, it was uh, in the top 90th percentile, and there's supposed to be a figure there. Well, yeah, there's a figure there. And so in all data sets together, it's in about the 99.9th percentile. So that's really pretty good. It does better than basically any random signature that you could find, and it's borderline clinically useful. So that's exciting. But the problem is, when you start looking at this a little bit more analytically, you realize that there's a whole lot of these. This is the performance of our biomarker, you can see an interesting trend according to the size of the biomarker, and that's the line for P less than 0.01. There's a whole lot of these, and you can kind of flip this problem on its head. You can ask, what are the characteristics of randomly selected biomarkers that turn out to be good in predicting patient outcome? And if we sort them, first of all, this is a cluster diagram, and Incredibly, it clusters in exact order of ascending size of the biomarker, how many genes we included. That is remarkable and incredible. And we can see that the vast majority of markers are red depleted, the vast majority of genes, I'm sorry, are red depleted in good biomarkers. In fact, there's only a tiny subset of genes that are blue that are enriched in good biomarkers. So this gives us an immediate feature selection approach. I was really proud of this until I found out that it was published in machine learning about a decade before and it's a technique called wrapping that was developed by a, a group at Stanford. Uh, and those genes are not the genes that you would have immediately expected. So start off with, there is this gene called CALCA. It's a calcium channel associated protein. It is in over 40% of the statistically significant biomarkers that we detected by random chance. By itself, it's not statistically significant. It's like a best supporting actor. It doesn't do a very good job by itself, but if you put it with a strong cast, it makes that strong cast even better. So you could think about this in two ways. The way in which I thought about it at first was, I tested 10 million 6-gene biomarkers in a lot of different patients, and my biomarker was better than 99.98%, and that's really important. But another way of phrasing it is that 0.02-ish percent of random markers were better than what I found. I only tested 10 million of 2.5 billion 6-gene markers that could exist. So there's at least a minimum of 500,000 ways in which you could solve this problem. And the community, after 10 years, had not found any one of them until our paper was the first one to even borderline solve the problem. So it suggests that this feature space is very complex and nonlinear, and we're not really exploring it properly. You might ask, if we just select the genes that univariately by themselves were good, would that tell us what genes would make a good biomarker? And this is the Spearman's correlation coefficient of individual genes with the performance of biomarkers of different size, and the answer is not really. They explain some of the variance, about 25 to 30 percent, but don't know more. And as we add more genes, it actually gets worse. And if we focus on the genes that we thought were most interesting, we can see that uh, their enrichment is very strong in small biomarkers, not very large in, in big ones. They are not generally correlated with one another. And if you take a look at their statistical significance univariately, they range from some genes that are really superstars to other genes that are part of a biomarker that works, but by themselves have no effect. 
And so I was really fascinated by this, so we started to take on a really big analysis, try to explore the null distribution of this space. So we took a look at 540 breast cancer patients as a training cohort, where we were validating, oh sorry, this is lung cancer again, uh, validating on 320 patients. And we started doing billions of permutations for each size, for each integral from 3 to 150 genes. Uh, we did multiple machine learning algorithms, naive Bayes, KNN, uh, SVMs, and we wanted to see if we could compare these in an unbiased way. Uh, we also did a randomized control to make sure that this wasn't a fundamental feature of correlation amongst genes, so we randomized the gene survival associations to, to be sure that wasn't happening. Uh, in the end, we spent 2.5 million CPU hours and did about 70 billion permutations. And the results from this I could go on for hours about. There are incredibly fascinating things. The first thing is that if we take a look at bins of accuracy, you would immediately guess that with any gene-based analysis, you want a machine learning method that accounts for strong gene-gene interactions. So it might be surprising to find that naive Bayes the only machine learning algorithm that we tried that ignores gene-gene interactions entirely outperformed everything else by a very statistically significant margin. In fact, in the most clinically relevant group, and this is a log scale, it's something like tenfold enrichment of uh, biomarkers by naive phase versus something like three or four for SVMs in random forests. And I would have bet you millions of dollars that random forests would outperform everything because we all use them all the time. And instead, somehow, our model is not actually what we think it is. And for a good biomarker, we didn't apparently need to, to know good gene-gene interactions. And A, I wouldn't have realized that. In fact, if my student had showed me this data based on a thousand permutations, I would have told him that it was just random chance, and they didn't do another thousand, another thousand. But when you've done this many, you start to, to realize that that's a true feature. You also start to see associations with uh, feature size where you can see that as you increase feature sizes, you get an increase in performance. And because we're only making a binary prediction, that's not overfitting. That's actually just a fundamental feature of us better modeling the data with more genes. And we don't know where the maximum would be, so we only went out to 150, and at that point in time, accuracy was still increasing. Now, obviously, it's still unclear if we can find those peaks and how well we've validated additional independent data sets, but that's actually quite striking. We also found that when you looked at enough of these, we found clear associations of success with other clinical covariates. So this plot here is a bit complicated. Each column is a patient. These are all characteristics of the patients. The blue are patients that were um, actually low risk. Their tumor was not lethal. The red are patients whose tumor was actually lethal. Each of these are different biomarkers selected in different ways. So the 100 best naive, bio, naive base biomarkers um, are all different rows here. Those are naive base with 75 genes, KNN with 75 genes, and so forth. And what you're looking at is black for a prediction that was correct, and white for a prediction that was incorrect. And you can see that there are patients where 100% of these 600 biomarkers all made the exact same correct patient, or say correct prediction. And yet you have patients over here where we took 600 randomly selected biomarkers, each one of which has an accuracy of 70% or higher, and none of them made the prediction correct for that patient. In other words, that patient is inherently difficult to classify, and we spent so much time trying to figure out what was the characteristic of classification, and we couldn't, until I happened to be collaborating with Quade Morris upstairs on a totally unrelated work about tumor cell heterogeneity. And there's a nice method that a, a former grad student of his, Gerald Kwan, published that was able to make accurate predictions of tumor cellularity from microarray data. We applied that, and the result is clear as day. There is a significant difference in tumor cellularity between the patients that we get right and the patients that we get wrong. In fact, it's something like a 20% difference in how much normal contamination there is in those. Yeah, go ahead. Can you define tumor cellularity? Yeah, so if we take a chunk of tissue, it's the percentage of cells that are actually from the tumor as opposed to circulating blood cells, immune cells, infiltrating normal cells. So things that don't have the malignant phenotype. Although they may not have a normal phenotype. So that result is striking because as somebody who does this, the first thing that we get when we present a 70% accurate biomarker to clinicians or molecular biologists is, can't you do the bioinformatics better? 
actually the answer is can't you prepare your samples better? <laughs> and that's a fundamental result because it says we should be doing laser capture micro dissection on every sample or we should be applying techniques like isopur to every sample before developing a biomarker. You couldn't find that without doing these millions of permutations, billions of permutations, but who has the energy to invest two and a half million CPU hours into these kinds of studies and does it hold for breast cancer and colon cancer and other diseases? So these are the kind of fundamental things that we can find out, but that are quite challenging to get at. Okay, so let's pretend that we have a biomarker that we think works, and now we'd like to apply it to an independent data set. Can we do that well? So this is work from a former grad student of mine who uh, is now in the Netherlands, and a current grad student in medical biophysics. And so a long time ago, I was focused on lung cancer research, and in lung cancer, very briefly, there are many different types of disease. And it doesn't really matter what type of disease you have, you have a very poor survival outcome. So the average survival of lung cancer patients is only 15%, average five-year survival. And these subtypes are generally treated quite similarly. So even though they look different under a microscope, we would treat adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas of the lung very, very similarly. And so this algorithm that I showed you before, that I'm still not going to go through in detail, was useful in, in creating a biomarker that might actually work. And we're able to license it to a company, the company is trying to bring it to market this year, and we're, we're kind of excited about it. But uh, when we did this validation, we got results that were sort of good. But a group published in 2010 in JNCI, so a very top tier cancer paper, that they tried to validate our biomarker on 400 independent patients, and it didn't work. And I wasn't actually all that hurt about it. You know, it's fine, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's actual research. But I wondered if they had done everything right because it's a little bit finicky to do these things. And they really didn't, it really didn't work. So here's a hazard ratio of 1.3 and a p-value of 0.1 and a hazard ratio of 1.00 and a p-value of 0.99. That's really not working. Uh, and so I asked Maud, as she was a student just kind of wrapping up, to quickly see and if, see if she could replicate what they did and make sure that the results were right. No harm, takes a couple of weeks. Uh, famous last words. It didn't take a couple of weeks. The first thing that she got were these survival curves, which are nicely statistically significant, 1.63 and 1.42. The same borderline utility for clinical results as we've reported before. And so poor Maud spent months trying to figure out what the heck the difference was. And the difference turned out to be, so I just want to emphasize the same data set, and they claimed to have used the exact same equations in everything that we had done. And the difference that she found turned out to be an incredibly subtle difference in the way that they pre-processed the data. Not something as obvious as, I changed the algorithm, but actually I tweaked a tiny little parameter in the algorithm that we didn't even specify in the original methods because we thought it was so obvious, unfortunately. <coughs> and when you did that, it changed the results from what I showed first to what I showed second. And so she started to look at this rigorously. And she said, let me try a panel of 24 different pre-processing methods and ask just how much does it change our predictions of how a patient should be treated. And here is a data set. Each column is a patient. Black is a patient predicted as a prediction of poor outcome. White is a prediction of good outcome. And each row is a different way of analyzing the data, just pre-processing the data. The machine learning and statistical classification is exactly the same. You can see that there's a core of patients who have consistent predictions but the majority do not. In fact, two-thirds of patients have differences in their prediction from one algorithm to another. That concerned us. We didn't expect that much variability. Yeah? Can you give an example of a pre-processing variability? Yep, so for sure. Imagine that we use a statistical algorithm that assumes that two, so your raw data is signal intensities. The signal intensities are confounded by technical variability or noise. For example, there might be stochastic effects or there may be um, an error that is associated with the hybridization to the array. You could have a model that assumes that that error is linear and additive, or you could have a model that assumes that it's multiplicative. You could assume that it is um, going to be Gaussian distributed, or you can assume that it's a, a, a convolution of Gaussians, or you could assume that it's an exponential distribution. And the different assumptions there will lead to different removals of signal from noise in that model. So. We looked at all these different models and we saw this profound variability. And uh, Maud was initially discouraged, but then had the really good idea of asking, what happens if we take a look at only those patients where all of the algorithms make a common prediction? 
and the results are quite striking. Here are the group of patients for which all of the algorithms agree. So this group here and this group here. These are all good, these are all poor. And you can see the performance of our biomarker goes up from something that might be clinically useful to something that is absolutely clinically useful. And it does too for both of the biomarkers that we're looking at. So what we've been able to identify is a way of using the information from multiple pre-processing methods. We know that they're variable, but it's a type of noise that is going to be, think of it as if the entire data set has some noise, and every way that we analyze it will lead to a different uh, approximation of the truth. And the group of all of those approximations together gives us some reality, gives us a better estimate of the real data. And so that's what we're doing here, and we come up with much better predictions. Very quickly, we're now looking at does this generalize in other ways, and Natalie's been looking at this at many more signatures and many more patients. And she shows the exact same level of variability across different algorithms in terms of univariate results, and is able to show that we can also see cases where we'll see large differences, sorry, um, significant differences in the performance between individual pre-processing methods like those versus a unified method which will get much more clinically relevant results, a hazard ratio of 2.4 versus 1.5. That turns out to be true across all of the different biomarkers that we looked at, and in fact we've since shown that that's true for proteomic data as well. We can do a better job of doing protein-based biomarkers in urine or in blood by doing the same type of ensemble method. So one last thing that I'll quickly close on is reproducibility of our results across algorithms. So we thought that we would take a look at some prostate cancer genome sequencing data sets that we've been generating at OSCR and ask just how reproducible different algorithms for identifying structural variations were. So we took 10 tumor normal pairs, a lot of sequencing, and they were all high cellularity to try to remove other sources of potential bias. <coughs> And we said, we want to understand just the best way to identify copy number aberrations or rearrangements where pieces of the DNA move around. We chose to look at only freely available software. We tried to install it all locally ourselves. We created a protocol for debugging. We would contact the authors. We'd give them this many days to respond. If they didn't respond, we'd bug them again. If they didn't respond, those kinds of things. Uh, we mostly kept near default parameterizations, and we had experimental gold standards. So that's kind of the flow chart of what we did. And when we look at that, we ended up evaluating this many tools, so something like 30 or 40. And we thought we were going to be able to do this in six months, install, run all the tools, and identify the one that worked best that we could apply to all of our genome <coughs> sequencing data. When we tried to install the tools, about half of them could not be installed. And we tried really hard. So we had two groups of people, a postdoc paired with an analyst in each case, and when one team failed, the other team would pick it up and try. We would contact the authors as many as three times at each stage of the pipeline to try to identify the problem. We fixed so many bugs in publicly available source code in that. And despite that, half of them didn't install. Uh, when we looked at the four that did install or the five that did install, uh, and we took a look at simply the number of predictions that they make, it ranges from uh, two million down to about 1,000. So I think that immediately tells you that they are not having concordant predictions. And in fact, if you take a look at the overlap of the predictions, they are mostly in the 0.3 range. So two different algorithms will have 30% overlap in what they call as a genomic rearrangement in cancer. We tried to do the same thing with copy number variation, which would be a much easier problem. And again, we couldn't install a quarter of the tools. Uh, we found that the average accuracy of these, most of these methods is in the 50 to 60% range. That's relative to microarrays as a gold standard. And maybe most interestingly, if you take a look at individual algorithms by individual samples, each row is a sample. Here's a sample where no algorithm made successful predictions. Something about the sequencing or something about that sample means that we were unable to do well. In other cases, we have an algorithm that does well on some samples, but not others. And there's some sort of a, we shouldn't be using this algorithm for all samples, we should be using this algorithm for a subset of samples and this other algorithm for another subset if we want to maximize accuracy. We're now doing a whole slew of validation studies <coughs> to try to figure out how this might work. Um, but you can immediately imagine the challenges that we face with this. 
<coughs> and so we learned a lot of things from this. The first is that our software sucks as a community and that we just have to do better. The second is that the intertool variability is huge and that we have to do a lot of things to try to remove false positives. But I simply couldn't afford this study again. So I had two full-time bioinformaticians, two full-time postdocs for two years to do that. We can't afford that. And as a community, now I'm evaluating software that's two years old. So instead, uh, next week, we're going to be launching a competition-based assessment of uh, uh, methods for structural variation detection and somatic mutation detection in cancer. We're using a competition-based approach because it distributes the workload so everybody can participate and we don't have to try to do all the work. At least it defers installation issues. We're trying to work out if we can have a cloud computing vendor provide a standard instance that people can work in. Uh, of course, it's easier to run regularly. It's well accepted through things like Dream or Cast. And there are prizes such as publication in top tier journals to, to motivate algorithm developers. And for this competition, we're in negotiation with a couple of the top tier major, uh, major journals for it. Uh, it's going to kick off in November. It'll be announced formally next Friday at the Dream uh, ISC, ISCB Dream meeting next week. Uh, it's going to be a six-month competition for people to download and make mutation calls on 10 tumor normal pairs. There will be an experimental validation and a winner declared about a year from now. That may not be as fast as we'd like it to, but that's a, a good starting point. Um, we're making all available, all data available. People can know the protocols. They can know every single thing about the samples if they like. Obviously, these are real human tumors, so there's a lot of things that we're doing to make sure that ethics and privacy are in place and people have to sign agreements promising their firstborn children. Um, we're also trying to bring in people from outside the genomics community, so there are monthly releases of in silico data sets of increasing complexity to try to motivate people to do that. And we're hoping that the winners of the in silico data sets will themselves be incentivized. So if somebody in the first month makes a really great um, uh, prediction on the in silico data that's simulated, they'll get a talk at Recom Seek uh, next May or June. Uh, and the winner will probably be based on balanced accuracy, but we haven't completely finalized that. We were able to get distribution through Anai systems, and we have to thank them for stepping up to, to be willing to distribute petabytes of data around the world, and uh, it'll be next Friday again. Yeah. So I'll close off by thanking the people. And I think to do the kind of work that I described, it can't be done by a bioinformatician alone. So most of the work that I do is uh, joint between a, a radiation oncologist, a pathologist, and a genomicist. And that lets us kind of detect problems in our things that we don't find a lot uh, sooner. I'd also like to thank all the people in my lab who did all the stuff that when I said I, I didn't actually do any of it. And these are the people involved in the dream challenge and the, the funders for our work. I'd be happy to take any questions. So, uh, that was a great talk, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if how surprised you should be that there are half a million 16 markers that work. I mean, if you've got six clusters of 10 genes each, and you pick one from each of those six clusters, and, any, and since they're all correlated with each other within each cluster, it shouldn't matter so much which one you pick. It might, based on how well measured they are. But then you've got 10 to the sixth, right there. And, and it, we know genes travel in clusters, so maybe it's not so surprising that there's so many? So, retrospectively, I am not surprised. But when I saw the data, I was surprised. And when we presented it the first time at ISMB, people were surprised. I think it may be a difference in appreciation for that in field, different fields of study, where in cancer biology that wasn't as well appreciated as it is in some of the model organism areas. But I think you're right. Today it's not as surprising as, as it might have been five years ago. Yeah? Uh, from the last question, well, the last selection you did from that you got the patients that were full, like the black and white, or, yeah. and you selected only the extremes. Yeah. The ones in the middle, did you see something in their samples? Why, like, or maybe the preparation or the place where they came? Any sort of trend? So basically, what do we think is causing the ambiguous classifications? Um, if I, and so I'm only speculating. We have no idea. We checked everything that you could imagine, tumor cellularity, data set, um, clinical characteristics, and there's nothing there. Um, 
what we think it might be is that the noise characteristics of those patients are not well captured by any singular method of removing noise, of denoising the data, and that they have a, a unique composite noise model that we don't understand. What I just described here, that idea of just taking the extremes is silly. Um, actually, the extremes fall into survival curves that are at the top and the bottom. And imagine that you had everybody agree except for one, two, three. It actually provides a continuous confidence metric. And we're trying now to figure out how you piece those together. Maybe if these eight algorithms agree with, e with one another, it doesn't matter if 42 others disagree, those eight will be right. And we may be able to use that as a, a kind of machine learning approach to get a better estimate of it. So those are things that we're exploring now, but we don't know the answers yet. Yeah. So two questions for you. First is relating to pre-processing. So a lot of the trend data sets that you're using, you mentioned microarray data. So microarray versus NGS sequencing, is the error rate less in NGS data? And the second part of that question is, okay, you mentioned heterogeneity, but most major hospitals, maybe that I know within the US are trying to use like fast clinical diagnostics, so wrap around sequencing, yeah. tumors, that sort of thing. So have you seen guidelines floating around on these tumor biopsy collection methods so that you know you're not wasting the investment in all of the sequencing and rapid prediction if yeah. you know the clinicians are just you know stabbing a tumor? As uh, opposed to dissecting it. So those are two good questions. So the first question was error models in NGS versus array, and the second one is uh, tumor heterogeneity in clinical settings. So in our experience, NGS data has much more inter-site variability than <coughs> array data does, and that's probably a function of the different maturation of the technologies. But um, we have a, a project where we're taking a look at prostate cancer genome sequenced in the UK. Well, let me not even explain that. A better one is the same sample was taken and sequenced at five different sequencing centers. And uh, I think out of all of these SNPs, coding mutations found in the tumor from the exact same DNA, just different aliquots to different centers sequenced at them, one was found at all centers and a bunch were found in four or five. I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but this is a tumor with 40 different SNPs and no, only one of those was found by all of the centers. So there's huge, huge variability that I think is much larger than we see in arrays today. Arrays, obviously, we've had more time in working out how to analyze and how to work with and how to, how to do the genomics of clinical heterogeneity. So in clinical heterogeneity, uh, sometimes you can't avoid it. So the tumor is inherently um, highly, highly mixed. So pancreatic cancer has almost always got that characteristic where it doesn't even matter where you put your biopsy. I would argue that the correct approach would be to either use computational methods or genomic methods to, to purify out the cells of interest in advance, and those are obviously difficult. And the rapid clinical diagnostics at US centers, I'm not aware of a single one that is doing that yet. Two last questions, otherwise you think of pizza waiting. So when you apply it, um, the consensus is that you different pre-processes to interest. Do you think bootstrapping would give the same result? Um, that's a very good question, so that's one of the things that Natalie's is trying. I don't know the answer to it. It kind of looks like it's the same kind of information. I, I, you know, what's funny is that uh, Quaid saw these data in March and said the exact same thing, and so that's where the idea of the track came from. So you're probably right, but I, we haven't done it yet. Mm, so I'll go ahead. Yeah, completely funny question. Uh, is there any, is it even possible to look at any uh, marker sets and look at the genes and go back to the functions and see how they fit in with the rest of the cell, treating the cell as a system, which would be a better way of explaining these millions and millions and millions of different types of tumor that you're seeing in like colon cancer or something. So that's a great, great question. So can we provide an underlying classification of tumors based on biological processes? Uh, so everybody hopes that that will be the case and that can be well done. And in our permutation analysis, we have been unable to do so, either supervised using existing gene functional annotations or discovering new ones and trying to identify clusters of genes that are moving together that might have a plausible biological function. That doesn't mean we've done it right, but we haven't been able to yet. And there's a, maybe a word of warning 
from the breast cancer um, RNA studies, which are the best work in that area. Um, if you want to predict breast cancer, you can have a marker of proliferation, how fast the cells grow. Or you could have a marker of tumor hypoxia, how oxygenated they are. Or you could have a, a marker of how likely they are to metastasize. They contain entirely different genes. Unfortunately, they select the exact same set of patients. So those biological processes that we hoped would differentiate subtypes are somehow traveling together, at least in the way that we're doing those analyses now. And so, it, yes, we want to do what you're describing, but I don't think that's being well done by anybody, and certainly not in a way that's clinically applicable yet. It's been very well done in prokaryotic cells. Absolutely. I mean, it's been very well done in yeast and in other organisms as well. But in human cancers, it may be that there is too much tumor cellularity, heterogeneity, there may be intratumoral heterogeneity where the same genetics are not true all the way through the tumor. Uh, it could be the simple increased complexity of the human tumor. But um, I don't think that we do that properly. Either. All right, we're only 10 minutes over. That's, I think, record for the year. Um, Is this the second talk? <laughs> Sorry? Isn't this the second talk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second day. But anyway, let's thank. Uh, 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 if you get to ask more questions, if you hang around, if you hang around and chat. That's what it is.